Well, this morning we're going to go ahead and, and uh, ask you to be turning your Bibles to, to Micah in chapter 6. And uh, you may have a little trouble finding that book, so I'm going to help you out a little bit. It's in the Minor po- Prophets between Jonah and Nahum. So if you can find Jonah and you can find Nahum, you can find Micah. Look, it's okay to use your table of contents. It's a, that's what it's there for. There's no shame in that. So just find your way there. This morning we're going to talk about a, a, an important subject uh, that most of us uh, probably struggle with and under, trying to understand. We're going to talk about the blessed life and what exactly does that, that look like? What does the Bible say about the blessed life? Because when we think about God and how God is described in the scriptures, uh, the God of the Bible is a blesser, right? Amen. He's, he's, he's a blesser. He's a giver of good things and not of evil things. And we need to get that through our heads sometimes to, to be able to live the life that he's called us to. But we have to understand what, what a blessed life is and don't let it get all warped and twisted by what uh, 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 false teachers like to tell you what the blessed life is. We're going to learn what, what the Bible says about the blessed life. And, and so we need to, to be able to do that. And so James 1.17 is a good place to start to remind us of who, who God is. It says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, whom, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And also in the Gospel of Matthew, it says this, Matthew, Matthew 7, 7 through 12, it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who is, if, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you, then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. So we'd all agree that we want to live the blessed life, that we want everything that God would have for us uh, according to his will. Uh, but the, the truth is most of us don't really understand what God's blessings look like. We, 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 re, we really don't. Uh, the, the blessed life that's been distorted and perverted uh, by, by too many smiling false prophets wearing, fi, uh, wearing shiny suits, right? Like to smile a lot and ask for your money a lot, right? That's what we see in, in the uh, evangelical world nowadays. They, they will offer you formulas that'll, that will force God or manipulate God to give you your best life now. Right. Or, or make it where your life can like every day your life will be uh, lived as though it's a Friday. Right. Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about and whom I'm talking about. It's prosperity preachers. They what they've done is they have cheapened the, the blessed life to nothing more than being healthy and wealthy. That's that's all it is that they, everything is focused on that. It's health and wealth. And that's if you're not healthy and wealthy, then you're not blessed. And that's not true. That's simply not true. Their view is that, that the, blessed, the, the, the blessed are the ones that God will prosper financially and will keep healthy. That's what they would say. And that anyone, uh, anyone that doesn't uh, uh, have the, those things that aren't wealthy and aren't healthy, then basically it's a problem with your faith, right? You're not healthy and wealthy because your faith is weak. If, you're, if, you're, if your faith was as strong as it should be, then God would bless you in that way. And that's simply not true. Because think about it this way, with that type of logic, if, if, if that were the case, then, then Jesus and the apostles had the weakest faith possible based on how their lives played out, right? If you just read the Bible and you look at Jesus and look at the apostles and look at their lives, would you, would you call them wi- uh, rich men? No, they weren't rich. They weren't rich at all. Would you, would you say that their, their lives were, were, were carefree and, and, and just tr- no trouble whatsoever? No, you would not say that at all. As a matter of fact, the Bible shows us that if you want to describe Jesus and the apostles, for the most part, uh, they were homeless men, minimal possessions. They, they lived with afflictions and persecutions. And guess what? They all eventually died a, 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 a brutal death except for John, and he died in, in exile. But before the, the church legend says that, that, that before they put him in exile, they tried to boil him at all, but he didn't die. And so he had to suffer through the rest of his days with these, with these burns and wounds, and so uh, their lives are, were, are, were blessed according to, to God's plans. So what does the blessed life look like for you and me? What, we need to get to the bottom of that. The, the, the blessed life for you and I, according to the scriptures, is a life that is content with whatever the Lord would have for us. That's what the blessed life would be. It's a life marked by contentment. So let's not be careful, uh, careful not to 
equate prosperity and health with being blessed by God because that's simply not true. All right, so if that's not you this morning, that's okay. You're, you're in the majority. And just an example that I find comforting to me that helps to illustrate this is when one day that Jesus was traveling with his disciples and they come upon a blind man. And some of you might be familiar with this story. They come upon this blind man and, of course, the disciples had this same type of a, a blessing and cursing mentality and they see this blind man and it's like, what, this guy's a sinner apparently. Jesus, who, who's saying him or his parents? Right? Do you remember what he said? He said, neither. Look at John, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Right? And so don't, don't always... Uh, look at something and maybe see somebody's what we'd say misfortune and say you know what what happened there what are they cursed by god and who sinned and what what's going on there because sometimes those things are a gateway to god's blessing they're blessed and don't even know it don't even realize they're blessed this man's blindness was a blessing and not a curse his blindness was actually a miracle waiting to happen is exactly what it was and so so he this man was like most of us or many of us And he was blessed and didn't even know it. Didn't even know it because his perception of what being blessed was 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 other than being blind. So sometimes for you and I, we need to remember that diversity or difficulty, the the things that we find ourselves in is actually God's blessings in disguise, right? You say, "Uh, I just got fired. Might be a blessing. It might be a blessing that, that God is removing you from a situation. Or, 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 or my, me and my, my girlfriend, we just broke up, right? My boyfriend, we just broke up. Might be a blessing in disguise. Or maybe my friends won't hang out with me anymore. Maybe it's a blessing in disguise that God is removing you and, and removing you from situations and breaking French, you know, relationships that are toxic and harmful for you. So we really don't know. So don't always think that what we would say a bad thing is is not God's blessing. It may very well be God's blessing that we would say is a bad thing. And so we have to be careful uh, with, with these things when they come into our lives. So which is it? Uh, you know, which, which is it? Is God's blessing uh, prosperity and wealth, or is it poverty and suffering? Right, Because that's the other extreme that some people would teach that, is that, that for us to be within the will of God and the blessing of God, is like we need to be, you know, uh, it's called the poverty gospel, the the one, the one example of, of, of going too far one way is, is, the, is the, uh, the prosperity gospel. The other end of the spectrum, and just as wrong, is the poverty gospel. That, that's where they would teach that, you know, we need to just, you know, have nothing, and the more we suffer, the more blessed we are. God loves it when we suffer and we're miserable, right? Y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about? That, 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 that people frown on anything you have. If you have anything nice, right, it, you, you have anything, any creature comforts or live in comfort or have a, have a savings account or anything like that, like you're, you're, you're being selfish and greedy, and that's just as wrong. That's just as much of, of, of a false teaching as a pro- prosperity gospel. But the truth is, and as unsatisfying as the answer it is, that the Bible actually shows both, right? The Bible shows both. He showed that God blesses some uh, with much, and he, and, he, and he doesn't bless others in the same way. So you, you'll see both, but actually... Most people are somewhere in the middle there that, that we're uh, like middle class Christianity is, is where most of us live at, that, that, that God provides everything that we need, each one of us needs. You have some that he gives more to and he has some that he gives less to. And that's just, that's just the reality of it. So we're all blessed just in different ways. So we need to understand this this morning. So let me pray for before we get into our text. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, the, 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 the blessings of our lives. God, I, I pray that this morning uh, this word would be an encouragement to some, Father. Some that are, that are struggling to understand maybe the, the circumstances of their life are difficult right now, Father. Maybe finances are, are, are a mess and, and just don't seem to be enough, Lord. And they just don't feel as though you're, you're, uh, you have a blessing for them or a blessing on their lives. So, God, I pray this morning that we would see uh, through your word, Father, what what exactly a blessing is, what, what exactly does it take to, to achieve a life that is blessed by you. Father, thank you for your word. Father, have your way with us this morning, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, 
uh, again, we get to use the Israelites. We get to use, use the people of God of the Old Testament as, as, our, as our laboratory. And as much as we tend to give the Israelites a hard time, we look at them with dismay and we see the many things that they do and continue to do and shake our heads. Uh, we, we see ourselves in them because they, they repeat many of the, the same mistakes over and over again, right? Kind of like what we do, right? Keep on doing the same things over and over again. They, they would wander away from God and, and His covenant love over and over again. They would worship false gods and violate God's, uh, the, you know, the, God's commandments that He had for them over and over again. And they would uh, always tend to mistake, and this is critical, and we do the same thing. They would mistake rituals as a relationship with God. Mistake rituals as a relationship with God, doing religious things, right? Doing, doing the pageantry, doing the, the, the being, just doing church is what they would have a, a problem with, and we have the same issues. So in our passage this morning, the, the prophet Micah is going to show us both the wrong way and the right way to achieve the, the life that God blesses. So we're going to start backwards. Usually you say you want the good news, bad news first, one of those things. We're going to start with the bad news, the, the wrong way to achieve the life that God blessed. Look at verses 6 and 7. Micah 8, verses 6 and 7 says, uh, with, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? With the, uh, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousands rivers, thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul. Israel, the Israelites were kind of laying it on kind of thick. They, they had once again found themselves on the outs with God due to their own sinfulness, their own disobedience, their continued disobedience. And of course, in the Old Testament, God would use prophets. And prophet after prophet, he would send to his people to call his people to repent of their sins, to return to him, to, to stop worshiping these false gods. The Israelites, also like us, tend to take God's gra- uh, mercy and grace for granted. Way too often, we just, we just expect it and we just kind of uh, ab- abuse it, if you will. The Israelites are also like us. They, they would go too far sometimes. They would even accuse God of being unfair and cruel at times, just that God just demands too much, right? He just, he just demands too much, too hard to follow. God is too hard. And so let's, look, let's back up a little bit before our pass. Look at verses 3 through 5, and we'll see how God responded to their accusations, their, their charges that, that they had made against God. Right? He gave them a, a quick crash course reminder of how he had blessed them and not wearied them. Look at, look at verses 3 through 5, uh, Micah 6, 3 through 5. It says, O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and, with, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. From Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Right? God was saying, I've done nothing but bless you. Right? You accuse me of being harsh. You accuse me of being cruel. You accuse me of, of being too demanding. I've done nothing but bless you. He says, he would say, he said, had God wearied them by setting them free from the bondage of the Egyptians? Was that wearisome? When I, remember when I set you free from slavery? Was that wearisome to you? Was that, was that hard for you when I did that? Or better yet, was it wearisome when, whenever uh, uh, with them, went by, get by them, when, when giving them godly leadership to guide them? Was that, is that troublesome for you? For me to provide Moses for you and, and, Aaron, and Aaron and Miriam, was that, was that too hard for you when I did that, when I provided that as well? Or better yet, was it, was it wearisome uh, whenever God decided to bless them, as, uh, as Balaam pronounced, instead of the, the curse that, that King Balak had desired, right? Y'all remember that story in the Bible that he, he called the prophet before him and wanted him to pronounce a, a curse over Israel, and the prophet went the other way, and he said, I will not pronounce a curse, I'll pronounce a blessing instead. Was that wearisome? And, of course, the last one there he speaks of, he's talking about from Acacia Grove to Gilgal. That just God summing up, saying, I have blessed you from the beginning to the end. 
from before the journey all the way into Gilgal, the first city in, uh, into the promised land, is, is I've blessed you from there to here. I've continued to bless you. Of course, Israel was convicted by this, by, by God's response. They, they were convicted by what uh, of their sin and what God had accused them of and, and reminding them of how he had blessed them. So the first thing they do, the, the problem we see from the text is uh, the, the Israelites, what they did, their response was, uh, a great reminder for us, being more religious does not bring God's blessing. All right, we need to hear that one. We need to hear that one loud and clear, that, that being more religious does not bring God's blessing. Uh, practicing cold, dead religion uh, was a big part of their problem, to be honest with you. That, that, that was the biggest thing they were doing is just, you know, their response was, let's just be more religious. We messed up, let's be more religious. And, of course, God is, himself is the one who instituted the sacrificial system for them to be able to address their sin. But see, the whole point of the sacrificial system was just to point them to the one who would be the one final sacrifice. It was to point them to the coming Messiah. It was to, to, to be a, a leading up to Jesus. Burnt offerings, thousands of rams, rivers of all. That's not what God wanted from his people, right? That was not what he wanted from his people. He says that they mentioned the, the use of young calves. The young calves were, were like the best, the best of the best. That's what uh, the best offering they could give as prescribed according to the book of Leviticus. And, of course, rams and all, they were commonly used in the sacrificial system as well. But, but you know, they, they said maybe, maybe if we give more of these things, right? These are good things, and, and Leviticus and the law says to do this, so... If a little bit is good, a lot will be great. So they really amping up the numbers there. Let's, let's, let's give more of these things. Let's be more religious. And, of course, the, the last option was just over-the-top ridiculous and wicked. This child sacrifice, really? Really, that, that we'd give our firstborn, we'll give our children, we'll, we'll sacrifice our children, children, and maybe that'll satisfy God? That's paganism, straight-up paganism. And it shows that their, their, their thinking had been influenced by the people of the land, right? Remember God said when you go into the land to, to, to separate yourself from the people of the land, don't, do not marry the people of the land, do not intermingle with the people of the land. That's why. That's exactly why, because you'll start to take on their practices and their customs. The, the Ammonites are the ones who are, who are mainly known for this practice, that they would sacrifice their children to Molech, it was, the, was their false god, and that's what they would do. And this detestable practice is something that spread all over the, uh, the area to regions as far as Phoenicia and, uh, and all over Canaan. And even the Israelites, sadly, had become, began to do the same things to an extent. That's not what God wants. That's not what God wants. That's, that, that's, that's the, the, the tainted uh, reactions of their lives as they intermingle with the people of the land. They actually, you know, the saying, uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well, when the Romans are, are killing their babies, don't kill your babies, is what God's saying. Don't, don't do what the Amorites are doing to flee from those things. So for you and I, we look at how the, 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 the Israelites were responding to this and being more religious. How do we do that? What are some things or, or some ways that, that we become more religious? What are some ways that we manipulate God, try to manipulate God through our religious activities? What things do we do when we tend to drift away from God to try to make, make things better, right? The, or the, the first thing that, that we do, I, I would say, is that we, we try to get more involved in church activities, right? We, we try to get more involved in. We, we've drifted or maybe we've done something, we've, we've sinned in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a major way, uh, you know, in our opinion. And so what we'll do is I'm, I'm going to make things up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be more devoted to coming to a worship service. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get involved in a Bible study or, or maybe... Uh, anytime there's a ministry opportunity, I'm, I'm signing up. I'm on a sign-up sheet. I'm raising my hand. I'm going to do all these things. I want to be involved. But all this is is an attempt of us trying to make up, you know, by doing more good things because we've been bad. Right? That's a mistake. That's a mistake to do that. Or, or how, about, how about this one? How about we just give more money to the church? Right? We, we give more money to the church. Now, now, I'm not talking about your reg, regular gift, not a tithe or nothing like that. This, this is above and beyond that. Right, much more than usual, but when you think about it, what you're doing, it's almost like hush money, right? It's almost like hush money or, or, it's, or like a bribe to make things right once again. It's like maybe I'll give, that, that I'll, I'll appease God's wrath and look, I, look, I've, I'm paying for my sins. I'm, I'm, giving some, I'm giving more money to the church and kind of smooth things over, but it doesn't work like that. 
Or how about this one? This is another one that, that you know, we, we find ourselves doing. We, we pray and read our Bibles more. Right, we're really going to crack down. I hadn't read, I hadn't read, and I hadn't prayed, and so now I'm going to make it, make up for it all, all right now. I'm going to just spend hours and hours and hours praying and reading God's word, just spending unusually long periods of time in prayer. And you begin to read your Bible like it's one of your favorite mystery novels. You just can't put it down. Just read and read and read, and not really comprehending, but just doing these things. All this is a, is just another attempt to make up for what you did wrong. Right? It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Now, to be clear, all these things are great, right? Pray, read your Bible, uh, give financially to church, be, be involved with the activity of the church, all wonderful and great things. We should all do those things. That's what, that's what faithful Christians do. The, the difference I'm talking about right here is the motive. It's the motive. What's the motive behind you doing these things? Why are you doing these things? Uh, right? It, it's out of love. It's a response of love for God and a desire to serve his people, right? To serve him and his people. That's, that's the right motive. A, a, a wrong motive is, by, is using these things as an attempt to earn God's forgiveness or, or to get him or to get back under his blessings, right? That's, that's the wrong thing, the wrong way to do this because we can't earn God's blessing. God's blessings cannot be earned, right? All, all that God gives to us is, is, is strictly a result of his grace towards us that we we can't earn anything from him. We, can't, we cannot earn anything from God. We cannot earn God's grace. We cannot earn God's forgiveness. And we cannot earn God's blessings. Can't do it. You cannot do it. The problem is, is when we try to do that, we're trying to put God into our debt is what we're doing. Right? We're trying to put God into our debt. We, we're, that just a reminder for you and I this morning, God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing, and we deserve nothing from Him, right? That's, that's the truth of the matter. And so it's all about grace, and, a, and just a reminder again that grace is receiving something that you do not deserve and you cannot earn. That's what grace is, and so that's what we're looking at as we relate to God and His blessings, right? Of course, the greatest blessing for you and I is that God desires to have a personal relationship with you and I. That's the greatest blessing that there is. It far exceeds anything that we can imagine. But this relationship only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way that this will happen. And through faith in Him, we can be forgiven of all our sins and be reconciled with God. That's, that's a blessing. That's a huge blessing. But this blessing of faith, this blessing of salvation, this blessing of redemption... It can only be received as a gift. Right? That's how the Bible says it can only be received as a gift that we cannot earn it through our good deeds or our religious activities. Ephesians 2, 8, uh, 2, 8 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Right? You're, you're not going to be able to say, I, I, I was good. I was good enough, and now, and now you have to save me. I did all these things, now Now you have to forgive me, God. I did all these things, and now you have to. God don't have to do anything. God don't have to do anything. Nobody's going to be able to, to shake their finger at God and say, you owe me. So clearly, it's looking at what's going on here with the Israel. The wrong way to achieve the life that God blesses is by, me, by being more religious and by trying to make God indebted to us by earning his blessings. That's the wrong way to do it, Right? And if God, God was not interested in the Israelite sacrifices, God was interested in their hearts. That's what God's interested in. He's, God, he's interested in their hearts. And for that, that, that God is not interested in our sacrifices, God is interested in our hearts as well. You know, Psalm 51, 15 to 17 uh, says it wonderfully. It says, O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for a relationship with us. He's looking for our hearts, our obedience. Uh, uh, E.B. Pusey uh, rightly summed up the, the Israelites' mistake when he said, he said they would offer everything, even what God forbade, except only what he asked for, 
their heart, its love, and its obedience. Right? Everything but what he asked for. So let's let's look at the rest of our time this morning. Let's let's see how what it takes. What it what does it look like to have the, the life that, that God would have for us, the blessed life, the right way to achieve the life God blesses. It's all found in verse eight. It's all wrapped up right there. It says, He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's how you do it. That, that, that's how we achieve the life that God blesses. Now, uh, there's a key word right there in, in the midst of that verse that many of us don't like. It's, a, it's the word required. Y'all know what required means? It's not optional, right? Required. This is something that we must do to accomplish it. It's, it's not an option. And we don't like words like that. We don't like to see words in the Bible that, that's, that like require when it's talking about a relationship with God. We just don't like that. We push back. You say, no, nah, God, lo- God loves us. Why? He don't require anything of us. Wrong. Wrong. That's absolutely wrong. He requires many things of us uh, throughout his word. If you read the Bible for yourselves. Now, one fear, when we start talking about requiring things, one fear is that it may lead to a works-based mentality, which is wrong and unbiblical. I just read that Ephesians says that we can't earn, we can't work for anything. But, but that's one of the problems that may happen when we start talking about requirements. Uh, another problem uh, that it causes is, is this, uh, if we don't address it right, it's a, that uh, God makes suggestions instead of commands, right? That, that's another problem that we have is that you know, I know the Bible says that God requires, but he doesn't really mean that. I mean, you know, God's okay with, you know, us doing kind of, you know, just do the best you can. God don't make suggestions, right? He, he doesn't give us things like the Great Commission. That's not, that's not a, the great suggestion. It's not, it's not you, know, you know, if you feel like it, make disciples of all nations, right? You know, do or don't, I'm, I'm really okay either way, Right? No, it's a command. It's an imperative. He doesn't make suggestions. Uh, you know, he makes commands. So uh, th- that, that's wrong, and we have to be careful of that. And sometimes when we use the words like requirements and, and, and God uh, placing weight on us and asking us to do things or telling us to do things, uh, really what happens is it makes people feel as though they're subser- subservient to God, like he's in charge of something. He is. You, you are subservient. He, he is God, right? We are, we are his creation. And so he has the right over us to, to tell us what to do, to command us to have requirements on us, right? We're not his equal, right? Some people say he's, he's my buddy, my buddy Jesus. Je- Jesus is your Lord. He's your Lord and he's your slavery. And, and yes, he's our friend as well. But first and foremost, he is our Lord. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And, 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 and he has dominion. And the right to tell us what to do. He commands us. He doesn't ask us to do things. He has requirements. So when God, God's word, when we see in the text of scripture, we see these strong words like require, you can be sure that it, that's exactly what it means. Well, Brother Mike, I just don't. It means what it means. When it says it's required, it means it's required. If you want to live a life that God will bless, there are requirements. And so here we see in the text that God countered the Israelites' offer with what he required for them instead of sacrificial religious activities, right? These superficial things that they were offering up. He said, I'm not interested in that. And Micah reminded uh, the, the, the people of God you know, of what that he had already showed them once, what that was good and acceptable in his sight in other places of Scripture. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. Way back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 14, it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? See, there it is right there. Again, the same word, require of you, but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. All right, now, what Micah does is like a, almost a condensed version of what was already uh, commanded once requirements. There's three things, 
three things the Israelites to have the blessed life, to, to get back in, under the life, into the life that God had, had, would bless. And the first one there in the list is to do justly. Right? To, to, to do justly. This means that God's people are not simply to know the right things and to tell other people about the right things. This means that God requires his people to do the right things. Right? Do the right things. And we talked about a little bit this morning at, uh, in Sunday school, uh, this, this idea that to, to, to fail to do what is right and just, it's sin. It's sin. Uh, Ronnie got inside my head this morning when he, he shared that verse. I was like, he done, he done got into my, my head or looked at my notes. Uh, James 4, 17 says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Right? You know, it's not, it's not enough to just avoid sin. Uh, you know, that, that's one thing. But there's also things that God tells us to do that we're supposed to do. Right? We cannot live in disobedience and expect God's blessing. It just doesn't work that way. We cannot continue to live in, in a way of defiance and expect that God's going to bless our lives. That just doesn't even make sense to even think that way, but many do. And the second way, uh, the second thing we see there that we're to do, to, that God requires of us, is to love mercy. Right? Love mercy is what it says. And, and, and as people who have received the greatest measure of mercy possible... Right? God's people are required to extend that same mercy to others. Right? That's what we're called to, to do, to, to be. The, the, the Apostle Peter, uh, he got a, a little crash course in that kind of mercy, uh, what kind of mercy God expected in Matthew 18. And, and I shared this before, but I think it's worth sharing again because it's a great reminder for us. Matthew 18, verse 21 to 35. It's a little exchange between Jesus and Peter. He said, then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was was brought to him and who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and, they, and that payments may be made. The servant, therefore, fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But the servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his, servant, so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, you know, but went and threw him into prison till he, he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servant saw what had, ha- what had, when his fellow servant saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his servant was angry, and his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you, to each of you, from his heart, uh, does not forgive his brother his trespass. Y'all see that? Mercy. We, we've received mercy. How in the world can we not be willing to be merciful to other people? We've been forgiven. How in the world can we possibly not be willing to forgive somebody else? If, we're will, if we are unwilling to extend mercy to others like we have been extended, we should not expect God's blessing in our lives. Right? We should not expect God's blessing in our lives. And, of course, the, the third thing there in our, in our verse 8 we're to walk humbly. God requires us to walk humbly with, with God. And when you see the word there, to, to walk, it, it's referring to the manner in which we live our lives. That's what it's talking about, the lifestyle that we, we have. Uh, another translation for the word uh, used there for humbly is, is to, to walk carefully, right? To, to, to be careful in how we live our lives. It, it means that we're to be careful in, in, in the, the, the company we keep, the, 
the, the way we conduct ourselves, the, the way we follow after our God. What God's looking for us to do is to submit ourselves fully to his will and design for our lives. That's what he's looking for, that, that type of life, to, to walk humbly with God. In, in Jeremiah uh, 29, 11 to 13, it says this. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope, that then you will call upon me and, and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. And then the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, he reminds uh, the, the Ephesians and he reminds us, he says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. All right. There it is again, that word walk, the, the lifestyle, the manner of life in which he has called us to. And you're not going to like this. I know some people really don't like this, but the reality is this. If you have trusted Christ, life stopped being about you when you gave your life to Christ. Right? That, that some of us don't like that because we're so selfish and so self-centered and we want everything to revolve around us. Me, me, me. I want, I want, you know, what I want to do. I want my stuff. I want to go do what I want to do. And the reality is if, if you've trusted Christ, you've given, your, you've given your life to Christ. You didn't just, you didn't just give uh, Christ your sin. You gave him your life. All right? that's, that's the whole purpose of following Christ and being a devoted follower of Jesus. A devoted life. A humble life, a life that's, that's careful to follow after Jesus, that's the only life that God will bless. Right? That's the only type of life that God will bless, the life that is fully given over to Christ. So this morning, as we finish our time, as we, as we close out our time together this morning, I have no doubt. I, I know that you want the blessing of God in your life. I know that because you're here this morning. Right? You're, here, you're here this morning because you want to be blessed. You want to live a life that's, that's pleasing to God. But let me remind you before you leave this place this morning, you can't earn it. You can't er earn the blessed life through your good deeds. The, the, the prophet Isaiah actually said that the best things that we could do are as filthy rags to God. That's what our works are. That's what they've accomplished, filthy rags. We also, we can't pay God back or, or put him into our debt. Remember, God owes us nothing. He owes us nothing. We, we could never do en enough to put God into our debt and say, well, now I've done this. Now, now you owe me. You you, you, you should bless me. If you're just, now you should bless me because I've done all of this. It doesn't work that way. Of course, hear me well on this last one. Being extra religious won't do it either. Right? Being extra religious won't, won't do it either. It, it, actually, if you look at the, the, the way the word for religion is used, most of the time it's a negative term in the Bible. And so uh, being religious actually kills people, right? It, it, it make, causes people to perish. It's, it's works mentality but only faith through Christ saves, right? So re religion kills and faith in Christ saves. So for us this morning, as we walk out of this place, I want you to know that God requires our obedience, right? He requires our obedience. He requires our hearts, and he doesn't want our sacrifices, right? He, he's not interested in our sacrifices. He's interested in our hearts. We're blessed when we do what's right. We're blessed when we do what's right according to him and not according to the culture. No matter what the culture says is right, we follow God's word. We're also blessed when we extend mercy to those who are undeserving of mercy, just like us, right? The same as us, that, that, that we are deserve, uh, would give away mercy, extend mercy to those who don't deserve it. And, of course, we're also blessed when we walk humbly with our lives fully aligned with God's design. That's what we're called to do. And just one more thing before we go, I would remind you of God's greatest blessing to all of us, the offer of a personal relationship with him through faith in Jesus. That's the greatest blessing there is, and it's, and it's simple to achieve. The Romans 10 uh, speaks well of this, and it says, Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that, uh, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? What a blessing. Romans 10, 13 says, For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? So, so this morning, uh, I would plead with you to receive the greatest blessing there is. Take your eyes off of the things of the world. Quit, quit thinking about uh, uh, money and material things and all those type of things and think about your relationship with Jesus. Do you have one? 
Don't leave this morning without making, uh, uh, allowing Jesus to bless you with salvation. It's far better than being wealthy and healthy. Far better. It, it's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and it's going to last forever. Right? Do that this morning. Whatever God has spoken to you this morning and moved on your heart today, I, I pray if nothing else, you're reminded that, that God loves you. God loves you and he wants the best for you. He wants to, he wants to bless you, absolutely. Uh, but also, I would, I would ask you to search your heart. Have you received salvation? Or are you right with God? Or is your life marked by obedience? Are you following after him hard? If not, today's a great day to do that, to say, I'm done. I'm done running from you, Lord. I'm, I'm tired of living in disobedience. Uh, I'm, I'm tired of, of, of living this, this substandard life. I'm, I'm tired of being religious. I'm tired of being religious. I'm tired of doing all these, these good things and being religious and playing this, this game called church. I'm tired. And so today would be a great day to do that. A great day to, as we close our time of invitation, bow your head there in your, in your, in your pew and just say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm tired. I'm tired. I need you. I, I need you to forgive me. I need, to, I need you to be my Lord. I need to, to get my life right. I'm, I'm tired of this. And so whatever it is that God would lead you to do this morning, respond. Respond without, without delay anymore. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for your word. Thank you for... Uh, the promises of, of blessing, Father. Thank you for uh, just the, the, the clarity from this passage, Lord, where we're able to see uh, your people uh, in, the, in the ancient times, Father, as they tried to, to earn your blessing, Father, as they tried to be religious and try to, to earn your favor, God, that, that, that you did not want that. You desired a relationship. You desired their hearts. You desired their obedience, Father, that you had things uh, for, for them, uh, requirements for them to do. You have requirements for us to do, Father, that, that you will not bless us, that our lives will not be blessed as we, if we continue to live in disobedience. So, Father, this morning, as we close out this morning, God, I pray that you would uh, search each heart in this place, each mind in this place, Father, that you would examine us, Father, that you would expose our true hearts and expose our true minds, Father, and that this morning as we, we finish, Lord, that... that, that uh, conviction of sin father that repentance would come to this place father lord thank you so much for loving us thank you for the 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 uh, corrective nature of your word the encouraging nature of your word father thank you for your patience with us thank you for your grace lord i ask all these things in jesus name amen